I, I just want to make that clear. It was not to uh, stand up for any constitutional right. But as a labeled Black American mother, the pain and trauma of what I saw happen with Keontae Spencer and George Floyd and countless others, the grief was just too much to bear. And so I could not, um, I chose to go and um, accept the invitation actually to be a speaker that day. Myself and one other individual in the city, um, uh, you know, were called upon to be a voice. Um, one of the organizers said, we thought about it when we met, uh, who could we call that could rally people together that we've seen working in the community in positive ways and nonviolent because she made sure that was one of the things that they um, put on the table when they said they were going to select the speakers. And um, so when they called me, um, of course, holding up justice for Keontae, it was something that I first had to make sure that it would not have been a trauma for the family. And so I wanted to communicate as best I could to find out if I lift this up is, you know, I don't want to reopen wounds of trauma that maybe was healing already. And so um, after speaking with the family, in short, I was given, um, you know, a go ahead to join in the community to lift up justice for Keontae. Um, now, we all know the things that we took to protest and rally against uh, objection to police brutality, institutional racism, environmental racism, systemic racism, symbolic racism, and hate in all such forms. That is what we um, stood for and still stand against. Um, throughout my experience tonight, I will share with you all some photos, um, and it's just. Um, uh, just, you know, to kind of um, keep you all abreast of some of the actions and past actions that we've taken as we uphold justice for Keontae. Now, I want to tell you that um, the rally at Washington Park was basically an opportunity to speak to the community about justice for Keontae. And that is um, something that I actually enjoyed um, having an opportunity to do. Also, I want to share, oh my gosh, forgive, forgive me for that technical thing. I had an app pop up, so that wasn't good timing. <laughs> but I also want to share with you all that um, after speaking at uh, Washington Park, uh, we did what I would consider a spontaneous walk that just happened to result into a mammoth of people also making a decision to walk behind a banner that read justice for Keontae. Um, as I just described, that walk was within the proximity of my community, um, Washington Park. I can actually walk out my front door, cross over by the YMCA, and I'm there in less than five minutes. If I head the opposite direction toward downtown, I am there in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. So this, this, um, this march and spontaneous walk, um, which was called a protest, we actually um, were planning to go to the Roanoke City Police Department and back to Washington Park. It's important to share my experience so that those listeners who didn't have firsthand witness account or you, know, you might've read things in the uh, media and that's sometimes the only opportunities people get to feed into um, hearing any, any sort of what happened. I wanna say to you all that we left our waters and um, snacks and foods and the things that we had that day at the park because it was intentional to go up and come back to Washington Park as our uh, final destination. Now I wanna take you through what happened um, as far as what a lot of people has read in my former complaint, which I did share for the public to read, I felt that when you are violently attacked at a time when you're standing against police brutality, 
that should speak volumes to why we cannot, we just cannot stop standing against and objecting and completely disapproving all of these sort of um, forms of hate and brutality. Um, as I saw the police officers getting into what I describe as riot gear, I knew someone needed to communicate intentions. Being that we were holding banners and signs, one would think the intentions were obvious. But unfortunately, when I'm watching a group of law enforcement get into face masks, um, all of these pads, and, and I'm standing there like, look, they're gonna slaughter us because we're out here with banners and signs and our voice. No, we're nonviolent. And, um, and so I took the call to get ahead of the group and I did have assistance doing that. Um, so on Campbell Street, the corner of 2nd and Campbell is really when um, things became extremely brutal and violent for, um, for us. And I say us because I was one of the individuals that w decided to take that walk from Washington Park to the police department back to Washington Park. Of course, you can see that was impeded. It did not go as we had envisioned. We had children in this crowd. We had elders in our community in this crowd. We had, it was a beautiful, um, just a beautiful gathering of, of all and everyone in our community in that crowd. And in that moment of seeing them get into this, I describe it as military gear and tactical gear, I understood the seriousness of that moment. And, um, and so I got in a, I started a conversation with a female officer and a male officer just pleading and begging, hey, let us through. We just wanna go back to Washington Park. I was given instructions that we could, uh, if I would go back and tell the crowd to take to the sidewalk, we could continue. Unfortunately, even with me hearing this agreement to let us through safely, I ended up um, suffering um, along with so many others. And of course, that's too deep of a trauma that some are still healing from that I don't wanna get into that part. But I will say that many people were injured that day, um, including myself. Um, I, it took days for me to get my voice. It took days to you know, recoup and heal and, um, and still trying to heal from that attack. Um, I, as we walk behind the banner for Justice for Keontae, um, I want to tell you all that horrifically, that day, May 30th, 2020, was not my first trauma of suffering a violent attack at the hands of police officers. It was just blatant police brutality and, um, in search of desperate solutions and self-advocacy in 2016, I attended a listening session. And in fact, Carl um, was with me, him and Brittany and some others from the community right here in Roanoke County. But um, I shared experiences with police and law enforcement in hopes to deter police brutality. Now this is four years ago. And since these police were in communities with me and my children, I hoped that Funding for training and a grant for 750000 would prevent what happened to Keontae Spencer and George Floyd and countless others. But as we see, this is what happened. And I have a video, short video, that covers that listening session from 2016. One second, y'all. I'm bringing that up right now. Improving police and community relations. That was what a community forum was all about today. And how the state just 
through $50,000 on that issue. ABC 13's Annie Anderson joins us live in Rome. Well, right now, there's a lot of eyes on community policing and how it can be done well. Now, a lot of times we hear that police want one thing and activists want another. But today, both sides were calling for the exact same thing. I put my hands up. Thank God. Get out of the car. Well, in order for me to do that, being that I was in my seatbelt, I would have to. The room was quiet as Bernadette Brown told a story of when she was pulled over. My kids would have been motherless. My daughter, my mom would have been daughterless. Had I put my hand down just to unbuckle my seatbelt. But even so, she was injured. I suffered a broken knee because the officer who stands taller than you, Mr. Moran, yanked my body out of the car. The worst part, she wasn't doing anything wrong. The call that caused me to be pulled was that a white male driving a black truck was brandishing a firearm. I was a black female driving a white suburban. That's why at a listening session with the Secretary of Public Safety, she said police need more training before they go out on the streets. And others agreed. When I started Virginia Police Training with the Jack, I was ill prepared. We have made tremendous strides. Are we perfect? No. Is there room for improvement? Yes, there is. And that's where Secretary Brian Moran thinks he may be able to help with some extra money from the state. We hear what people need. What are their desires? What are their needs? So that we'll create uh, that grant process so that we can we can actually address their needs and, uh, with this money. Now the grant's only for $750,000, and that may sound like a lot, but spread across the entire state, it just really isn't. But some of the recommendations, like keeping track of the racial profile of every traffic stop, is totally free. Other states do it and are able to use that information to check to see if departments are pulling over a disproportionate number of people in one And And so as you can see, I now am proud to say that um, I am on a different path to prevent police brutality. I um, want those resources to go to places where if when you're in a crisis or crises, you can get someone to come help you that can meet the need of that crisis or crises. Not a stranger with a gun showing up at your door and and that's where i am and tonight um we have with us um a dear friend of mine uh jay lambert he is a part of the justice for keontae group and he has been serving with me for over four years he's also an organizer um with Roanoke's people power network which is an independent working class organization Focus on building people's power here in the streets of Roanoke. Jay, we welcome you to share your experience as a part of Justice for Keontae Group. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, BJ. Uh, and thank you to Artivism Virginia and everybody uh, who's on the call tonight. Um, so as, as BJ said, um, I believe we met BJ back um, when, uh, when Keontae um, was killed. Um, so Justice for Keontae, um, we had a long struggle and it's still continuing. Um, but I guess tonight I'd like to sort of speak on um, Roanoke People's Power tried to sum up, summarize almost a year's worth of organizing um, and struggling for justice for Keontae. Uh, I believe it's uh, the link to the article that we wrote is shared in the chat. Um, but yeah, we tried to sort of just detail like the facts, um, you know, for, for instance, you know, if anybody didn't know, he was um, on February 26th, um, he, was, uh, he was killed on that day. Um, he was walking down a busy street, 419, um, in the area he lived, which is 88% white, um, listening to music with headphones on, and uh, from the police narrative, he was supposedly, but never proven, never shown any evidence of, um, just claimed 
by the police to be holding a broken toy BB gun. Um, so, so yeah, from that day uh, till now, there, there has been no justice served. Uh, Roanoke County Police Department, especially Chief Howard Hall, have been grossly neg negligent and consistent with their stories. They've lacked any type of transparency. They've predictably made it as difficult as possible for Keontae's family, Carl, and um, his, the whole family to uh, get any information, let alone like any type of justice. Um, the names of the police, of the cops who killed him, and the dash cam video footage have still to this day never been released to the public. Um, their names have never been released. Um, so, like I was saying, you know, I, I did just, and I don't want to read the full article, but there are some points that I, and I feel like it, it sums it up somewhat well. Um, so from the beginning, uh, there was, you know, the beginning of solidarity of, of people coming together and um, recognizing that this happened, and then a variety of groups starting to work together. Um, the NAACP was there in the beginning as well as some of us from Roanoke People's Power Network, um, which used to be called 15 Now Roanoke. Um, there was Plowshare Peace and Justice Center folks. And um, we started like calling together like community gatherings. Um, and pretty shortly thereafter, after meeting with Carl, um, for, um, formulating demands, uh, formulating demands in regards to Keontae. And, uh, you know, what does Carl and Keontae's family want in terms of justice um, at a bare minimum, which was, there was three demands. It was uh, release the names of the cops who killed him, release the dash cam videos, and do an independent investigation. Um, pretty, like, basic, pretty basic um, calls for, for um, very minimal <laughs> calls. So, so yeah. Um, Let's see, over the course of a couple months, we were trying to build this struggle, right? Get those demands out there. Um, eventually, I think two months later, two or three months later in May, um, Roanoke County Police investigated themselves for a couple months. And then they announced that they investigated themselves. Um, they held a, a private closed, to, it wasn't open to the public. It was a private press conference where they announced um, like the results of their investigating themselves. Um, and uh, that was at the Public Safety Center in Roanoke, where the picture that was just shown. Um, so a few of us went there during this closed press conference, and BJ, myself, a few others were there. Um, we went to hold the banner and to find out, like, you know, what they're going to claim that they were responsible for, which ended up... Um, not claiming anything, basically, not being responsible for it. But uh, they, they, sent cap, they sent cops out with their hands on their guns and even guns drawn um, for four people. They had a whole section uh, that they had like set aside for expected protesters. Uh, and there was four of us there. Um, so it was just another example on that day. Not only did they investigate themselves, you know, but, and there, um, but they send, they send the goons out <laughs> on us right then and there, um, for holding a banner. That was in, that was pretty ridiculous. Um, so yeah, they, they didn't find any wrongdoing. Um, and then as a response, Justice for Keontae decided to put together a statement, our own, our community response to the police investigating themselves. We held what we called a, a people's press conference which you can see in this picture here. It was in front of the, uh, I guess that's the Roanoke County uh, Jail. Um, and uh, so yeah, not only did we hold like a press conference and write a statement, um, but we got a whole lot of folks to sign on to the statement, including um, two presidential candidates, both of whom are, were socialists at the time, uh, Monica Moorhead with the Workers' World Party, and then Mary Scully was an independent socialist. Um, they endorsed our bare minimum demands for transparency, accountability, um, the, the three demands. Um, so I thought we thought that was fairly notable and had, had a really good turnout there. Um, you know, so I'm, 
I guess I'm just trying to explain all, all the different things that we um, try, all the different avenues we tried to take. Um, so after that, you know, after the county cops found no wrongdoing, then we said, well, who else do we go to? So we decided to go to the Department of Justice. We started holding a series of rallies um, at the U.S. Attorney's Office downtown Roanoke, and we called it Where's the Justice, DOJ. Um, so we went there with a number of uh, folks in Justice for Keontae and community members. We were greeted by like Homeland Security in that office, which we asked if that was normal that they have Homeland Security there. Um, let's see, around the same time, the NAACP and the ACLU um, uh, was writing a letter to Governor McAuliffe. Um, the U.S. Attorney um, eventually, or, or like during this time, ended up recusing himself, and that was a U.S. Attorney John Fishwick when he was the U.S. Attorney. He like took himself off of the case, uh, claimed that he had some type of conflict of interest, and then the new person that took the case uh, basically wouldn't really respond to us. Um, so, but we did like file a petition with them, right? And that was, I'm trying to see the timeline. I think that might have been in July when we were when we filed the petition, July of 2016. Um, three months later, uh, and finally, um, and we might have actually filed the petition before then, but we started going to the U.S. Attorney's Office in July. But a few months later, um, we hosted a Keontae's Day for Keontae's birthday um, at uh, a community church. And... A number of us in Justice for Keontae finally got to meet Carl's mom and Keontae's mom. She came to town. And so that was a really uh, nice, nice event. Um, there's a picture from it. Let's see. And then like in November, it looks like, um, after five months of pressure, the Department of Justice finally announced that they had done a review quote unquote, they call, called it a review, not an independent investigation of Keontae's case and released their findings stating that there was insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the officers acted willfully with a bad purpose to violate federal law. Accordingly, federal review of this incident has been closed without prosecution, blah, blah, blah. So from February to November, pursuing all these channels, quote unquote, the appropriate channels that we're supposed to take um, to get them to say that. So then a month later, we sort of uh, did a response. I mean, we more so just did a rally. We called it the People's Rally Against Police Violence. Um, you know, we wanted to, to respond to the Department of Justice's statement. And we have folks from out of town all over the place come. We have people from Richmond, from Raise Up for 15 in Richmond. Uh, New River Workers Power in Blacksburg. We had um, folks from CARE in Lexington and Citizens Pre Preserving Rockbridge County. Um, there was folks from Charlottesville that came. So we did a rally in Melrose Park. We, folks shared personal stories, just like tonight, um, about harassment or abuse they faced or seen. And we reminded each other we are all we, are all we have to depend on. And though in some light that can seem depressing and overwhelming, it is also powerful as they are few in numbers uh, yeah. and we are many. So um, just to wrap it up, sorry if I'm taking too long, uh, but we have uh, like the takeaways from it and my, and my analysis, and it took me a, over a year to like just try to analyze the year's worth of work that we, that we were really doing it heavy, that we were really trying to pursue justice for Keontae pretty heavy, was that like, unfortunately, um, pursuing justice through the appropriate channels, petitioning, pleading to the cops, to the Roanoke County cops, pleading to the County Board of Supervisors, the Governor McAuliffe, the U.S. Attorney and Department of Justice, for a young black student killed by cops brought zero accountability. It brought zero transparency or justice. It did, however, expose the system and their sham process to us. Or it at least reaffirmed that for those of us who weren't clear on that fact. But, um, you know, and that white supremacy is embedded in the police institution, including Roanoke County, including Roanoke City, regardless of specific cops or individuals and their personal tendencies. Um, and, you know, that we cannot depend on the state 
to keep us safe or to be accountable for their violence against us as the system protects itself. And we were shown that at every level, the local, the state, the federal. Um, so, you know, un unfortunately, the, the, the police responsible for this um, are most likely back on the streets right now, right? And they are probably also trying to build false trust in our kids' schools, um, coming and dressing them up in riot gear that then they, um, you know, wear themselves a week ago and pepper spray kids in strollers. Um, so MJ. this injustice, if anything, you know, is one of the reasons why they kneel and one of the reasons for sure, like why myself and why we organize and should organize. And thank you. And I thank y'all. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for um, sharing with us. Um, and it, it was a lot. And as he said, it's a lot goes into this uh, fight for justice. Um, um, now I'll introduce Carl Spencer, a phenomenal individual who has held up justice for Keontae. Carl is the brother of Keontae Spencer. Carl's unwavering strength on this path of justice for his brother Keontae for my life has been honorable and humbling. Um, and I know not just for me, but for me and so many others. Carl, we welcome you now to share as well. Hello, everybody. For those of you who don't know, my name is Carl Spencer. I'm uh, Keontae Spencer's voice, but I'm also his biological brother. I want to start by saying, although I am proud to be a part of the biggest civil rights revolution in history, one of the biggest civil rights revolutions in history, I find no joy in the events that led me to this having this platform. This is still extremely hard. So if you see me looking down, it's because I wrote a couple notes. Uh, my brother was murdered by the Roanoke County Police Department. He was shot not once, not twice, but three times in his neck, his chest, and in his private parts. While bleeding out on the street corner, scared and alone, they then handcuffed him. My brother was a lot of things. He was a friend, a son, a brother, a high school student, and a black man in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I guess being black anywhere can be the wrong place at the wrong time, I guess. But um, my brother liked to sing. He liked to write music, dance, play video games, play basketball. And he had so many dreams. But because he was walking while black, one of the most serious crimes in America, that's all there will ever be was just dreams. He didn't get to graduate high school. He didn't get to go to college, have kids, get married. He didn't even really get to figure out who he was. He was still a teenager. I wanna tell you a little more about February 26, one of the worst days of my life. On, 20, on February 26, Keontae did the normal things he usually did. He laughed, danced, he recorded videos on his phone. He texted on his phone, took pictures with his selfie stick that he had with them every day. Um, he went to get food, he hung out with his friends and around 7 p.m., a little after 7 p.m., he began walking home, a trip that he'd never get to return from. <clears throat> While walking down the street with headphones on, the police approached Keontae from behind him. They had a dog with them. They had someone with a beanbag gun less than three minutes away, but instead they chose to murder my brother. As soon as he turned around, he was shot and handcuffed. He didn't commit a crime. Uh, he didn't harm anyone. And yet he still lost, it, lost his life that night, cause of death being black. George Floyd's birth certificate said the same thing, just like Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and countless others. When we say Black Lives Matter, it's a hope that in the coin toss of getting stopped by the police, that they'll remember Black Lives Matter before murdering another innocent person. I've been fighting for justice for a long time, each step harder than the one before. And still to this day, it's no dash cams that have been released. There's been no officer's name released. And then the one time they did let me go see the dash cam video, it was just me and a lawyer. And it really shouldn't even be considered a dash cam video because it was a compilation of stuff, just compilation of videos that they threw together. 
So basically they deprived me of even being able to see my brother's final time standing on this earth because at the very last second when the shots were fired, neither him or the police was in that last frame. It was just shots fired. So now I have to be my brother's voice because they took his. I have to be his future because they took his future. He didn't have a chance to have his own. How much more of this can we take? Hopefully we take the same anger towards the frustration that we have with George Floyd's murder and use it the same way towards the justice for Keontae and the way the police killed my brother. But I just want to thank you guys for giving me the time today to come on here and speak, speak to you guys. And uh, before, right before I stop, I just want to let you guys, leave you guys with a few thoughts. One, police chief Howard Hall himself acknowledged there was someone with a beanbag gun minutes away. He acknowledged that himself. Two, everyone who saw Keontae that day said he had a selfie stick with him and headphones. Nobody said he had a BB gun. And I talked to people who seen him that day. Uh, they even robbed me of my decency of seeing him standing last, like what he had on and everything, just because they wouldn't even show the footage of the dash cam video of when he was shot. And that's just, it's crazy, man. I don't even know, like, how to end. I don't know what else to say. I hope uh, you guys can think about it and, you know, just let it marinate about how these cops are doing these days. I just want to thank you guys for letting me speak. And uh, I want to turn it over to whoever speaks next. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, um, let's just take a minute. Let's just take a minute to receive the tragedy of this story and the um, courage of those who are still telling it. Maybe just three good breaths. I loved what you said about Black Lives Matter as a hope. Um, we have another member of the Sunsing Collective who's been on the streets in the last couple of weeks and small rural town and quite a different, more hopeful experience. So maybe we'll have more of those. So I wanna hand it over to Camry Harris uh, better known as Camry HD. Camry's a member of the Sunsing Collective, professional musician and music producer, and he lives in Martinsville, Virginia. Camry, are you there? Hi there, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, everything's black on my screen right now, so I'll just go with it as, as it is. Um, I just want to start off just by saying to Carl, wow, that was, that's a load, brother. And I, I've, I've known you for a while, but I never knew that, that, that all of this, you know, had taken place in your life and with your brother. And wow, if, I just want to extend my hand, you know, if you ever need a, a, a person to talk to, you know, I'm in Martinsville, I'll give you my number and stuff after this, just to have somebody that, you know, you can walk along with as a brother and be able to talk to if you ever need me. Appreciate it, bro. Um, my name is Cameron Harris. I'm from Warrensville, Virginia. And um, I, let's see, it's been about two weeks now. I actually did a peaceful protest in Warrensville, Virginia. And um, the outcome really actually was uh, was, was life-changing because it, it went 10 times better than I expected. Um, you know, I had I had some fear, I had some doubt before going out on the road because, you know, I 
I've been watching the news, you know, who hasn't seen all the riots taking place, who hasn't seen, you know, all the people getting shot, whether it was with, bull with regular bullets or metal bullets or, or you know, I mean, you know, rubber bullets or anything like that, you know. So, in a way, before I went out, yes, I was scared for my life because I didn't know what was going to take place in my city. But at the same time, I, I know that, you know, in my mind and in my heart that I wasn't going to, to, to be destructive, but I wanted to have my voice being heard because I've had instances where I've been on the road. I've been a touring musician for over eight years now, drummer for different bands before I started, you know, doing other music. And I've had experiences of, you know, being on the road and going to venues or going to different places to perform. And then after the show being told, I couldn't come back because, you know, I was the only one in the band of color. And, you know, that just, I don't know, I don't know what it was. You know, I, I've never been a disrespectful person. I've always tried to to be kind and, and gentle and everything with anybody I ever came in contact with. And just to have, you know, those things being said to you, not even by the the owners of the establishment or any of the people in the establishment, but the people that you play with and, you know, toured on the road and done shows with, you know, come back and tell you this stuff. It's, it's hurtful because, you know, I can't change my skin color. I can't change who I am. And I'm very, very happy to be who I am. Like it's a certain level of pride that I carry with this skin that not, you know, not many people will understand at all unless you, you know, you wear the same skin that I'm in. And um, and I had a chance to talk with our, our local police chief and some of the officers officers in the city. Um, just the experience alone that they, they, they I'm not going to say that they protested with us, but they, they walked beside us. They, you know, got at traffic to go around us and they were really, in a way, supportive of the protest. And when it was time for them to, to just listen to, you know, people in the community that wanted to talk to them and, and speak about, about what was going on, what they were dealing with, they actually sat there and listened and gave back feedback after, you know, we all were done talking, which was a very big deal because looking at the media and stuff now, you know, that's not really happening. People are coming in, they're coming in with force. And that's, that's really kind of the only thing that's happening. There's no listening happening at all. So just to have that experience, was was you know life changing and, and very beautiful at least for me in my city, um, and I just it, it's a lot going on in the world right now and I think that overall you know if we can all sit down to a place to just be able to listen to one another and let while we listen and don't have a judge judgmental thing in your mind hear what the other person is saying and respond from that not from not have a response that's already made up in your mind that you've been you know holding me in because i've seen a lot of conversations just back and forth with people you know just yelling yelling back and forth at each other you know one thing to another that you know literally you, you people lose exactly what they're fighting for because there's so much other stuff going on and there's so much stuff that's just like you know taking the place of people's mind that it shouldn't be but hopefully you know, this message of just, you know, I had a a protest that actually, that I feel like made a difference around me happen. And not only that, I know that it definitely touched the lives of people that it needed to from, that were, that were in this area. So hopefully that was, that could give some inspiration to other people that are, you know, working out, working out here on protests and doing their own thing to, to, you know, have a peaceful resolve to everything that's going on also. So. That's it. Thank you guys for your time. I'm Cameron Harris. Thank you, Camry. Um, so I'm going to make a little invitation to people to go into smaller groups for a few minutes and just share their own stories or um, listen to some more or just share their responses to what we've already heard here tonight. Um, so if you'll accept that invitation, then I'll cue you back into the larger room and just remember to, um, to, to honor and protect time for each person to speak when you go into your rooms. Okay, here we go. Thank you. 
Carl, is there anything more that you wanted to share? You didn't really get to, to share much for that one. Um, I mean, I wrote a, I wrote down, I wrote down all of this stuff right there. Everything what I was saying, I was with all of these pages. If I uh, if I tried to go into real details about a lot of the stuff throughout this uh. Throughout fighting for justice for Keontae, I could go on for months of all the crazy stuff that happened. But um, Carl, you know what I was thinking, man. If I, if it's okay, if I say something to you real quick, <laughs> man. The people who have showed out now. We needed them to show out in 2016, you know what I mean? Yes. February and March and April and May. We needed to take the streets. We needed to flood the streets with people. And uh, I'm glad it's finally happening everywhere, like across the, across the world, not even just the US right now, it's international solidarity, you know, going on. But man, if we had had that, it's, but it's good to see folks bringing Justice for Keontae back up. like. Mm -hmm. trying to push for a heavy again so we're we're a little we thought about hearing from the different groups who went out to share you know together but we're, we're running a little short on time and we want to honor um the fact that our facilitator tonight bernadette lark has to go and join sam rasul's uh protest to policy you write the bill meeting. I, I know a lot of you are, are, are clicking off to join that and we highly recommend it. We have the link for it in the chat. Um, so probably we'll start to think about closing this, um, inviting you again to the next street singing workshop. That'll be the last one. Um, in two weeks, and then next Thursday, the last Sun Sing in Place concert with the focus on environmental justice and the fight to protect Union Hill and the Poor People's Campaign. I think um, most of you are probably aware of the big plan that they have for June 20th and how their leadership has kind of brought together all justice issues uh, and without prioritizing any, what, in a way that prioritizes all. So that's really exciting. So I just wanna thank you all for being here. Jay, Camry, Bernadette, Carl, sharing, uh, listening. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll close now to let folks scoot over to uh, support Sam Rasool. We see you, Jay. We see you. Thank you, everyone, so much for um, offering all that you do. And I just want to say we, we posted um, the recent pe petition link for Justice for Keontae in our chat. Um, it's right there at the bottom. And I look forward to reconnecting with you all and seeing you all soon. And thank you again for sharing this time this evening. Carl, once again, thank you so much for being with us, and Jay and DJ, too. Thank you. Good night. Be safe. Thank you.